morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to see you all here this evening and to welcome you to Seven Decades, the story of three guitars that changed the world. So I'd like now to introduce Will Hodgkinson, who's chairing the Q&A. He's the chief rock and pop critic for The Times uh, and also contributes to Mojo. Um, but he also wrote Guitar Man, um, a book about the experience of learning the guitar and learning to sing before performing to an audience uh, very soon afterwards. So uh, I'll hand it over to Will. Thank you very much and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I just want to make a tiny addendum. Guitar Man trying to learn guitar, which is a quite a big difference from actually succeeding in being any good, which is why my respect goes out to these people. So we have Johnny Burrell from Razorlight and a solo singer, a solo star of uh, great, great uh, talent, repute and success. And we have Kevin Brennan, Shadow Minister for Arts and Heritage, who's also, I believe, in a parliamentary band. Is that right? Yes. Which that I'm is correct. Very much looking forward Legend to hearing our own imaginations. Brig Smith Start, who is a guitarist in The Fall, in what I believe, and I'm not just saying this, I do believe was their golden period, which was an incredible album called This Nation Saving Grace. And since then, Brix did a band called The Adult Net, which is great, and now Brick Smith and The Extricated, which I believe is with some members of The Fall and playing you know, a lot of those fantastic songs. And Bill Kirbishley, who is manager of The Who, Jimmy Page, been manager of Jimmy Page, and Robert Plant, and I believe has got quite a lot of experience of the character that makes a guitarist, for better or for worse. Is that fair enough, Bill? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I want to start, and this question doesn't really go out to Bill, but it goes, goes out to everyone else. I'm going to start by asking you, Johnny, what was the first guitar that you bought, and can you remember how old you were? In terms of entering into the capitalistic exchange of money for the guitar, <laughs> or the first guitar I ever had. It could be the guitar that your auntie gave you, you know, to kind of keep you quiet, or, or the opposite. Because I think, yeah, I think it was more like that. I think guitars have always just sort of come my way, you know? <laughs> and I think that's the best way for it to happen, you know? But the first guitar was, um, I was grounded, and my brother wasn't. So he went out, he got to go and see Faith No More, who were playing at the Bataclan in Paris at the time. And because he was out, I got to go into his room and play his guitar. <laughs> and that was, that was the first time I ever played guitar. And incidentally, the first time I ever wrote a song, which I didn't realize I was doing at the time. That's quite impressive to write a song as soon as you pick up a guitar. It normally takes people... It's called plagiarism. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just... I've heard it works very well. Yeah, well, exactly. I, he had a book which told you how to play Scarborough Fair. He said, here's an A minor and E minor. And I thought, I don't really want to know how to play Scarborough Fair because, you know, parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme, I'm, yeah, I don't, that doesn't mean anything to me. So I kind of, I took the chords and then I monotone, with my monotone, like that, I started saying a poem over it. And after I put the guitar out, I walked out of the room and I was like, oh, maybe that's a song. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that was it. So it began. Kevin, how about you? When, when did you first either buy or at least pick up a guitar? Actually, quite similar. My sister had a guitar, and I, I picked her, her guitar up and started playing it, and started playing A minor and E minor, and wrote a song. So it's a very similar sort of story. I think mine was quite political. It was about the, the, the murder of IND in Chile. I was quite a serious teenager <laughs> at the time. But, and I remember, so in, terms of, in terms of buying a guitar, I, I just remember standing outside the Sounds music shop in Cumbran in South Wales, where I come from, and in the window was a Fender Stratocaster, and it was 300 pounds. And I might as well have been trying to go to the moon. There was no way that I could get that. But eventually, about two years later, I saved up about 50 quid and bought an acoustic uh, guitar, which was a sort of hummingbird, copy of a hummingbird Gibson, a kind of Ibanez sort of thing. And it was a very nice guitar, but um, that was the first one I ever bought. Briggs, how about you? What was the first guitar that you bought or had? Um, well, actually, I I bought a bass. I started on bass. I was at college and I used my book money and got a secondhand black carbon bass and taught myself to play. But the first guitar I ever had, really, was given to me by the guitarist from Joan Jett and the Blackhearts when I was 19, who I was dating. And I was going off to England to join the fall. And he said, I want you to have this. And he gave me this. Uh, Gretsch Corvette from the 60s, which was cherry red, solid body, 
but light as air, because I'm only little, so I have little hands and a little body, so it was perfect for me, because it was very light um, and very powerful, and so that was it. And then I have a long history with that guitar, which is called God. It was stolen from the back of a van in Cardiff, uh, when, yeah, when I was in the fall. Um, it was lost for a really long time, and then I found it on the wall at Andy's guitar shop. And I had to prove that it was mine by showing them a picture of me playing it on the TV show, The Tube, which I did, and I got it back. And then years later, when I quit music for a while, I gave it to Ian Brody from The Lightning Seeds, and he kept it for me for 15 years. And I've only just got it back about two years ago. When he kept it, do you mean he kept it as in he wouldn't give it back, or <laughs> no. he was... Uh, he it does sound like an amazing it. guitar looked after it because I was like, I don't want this anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with music. I give up. It's over. It's over. I'm on to other things. And he, he thought, you'll be back, Bricks. You'll be back. So he was such a good friend. I apologize on behalf of my constituents for stealing your guitar. <laughs> <laughs> they knew a good thing when they saw it. So Bill, I don't know. Have you, do you play guitar at all? No. Uh, no, I don't play any instrument. Um, if I had have done, I would love to be able to play piano. Okay. But, um, if you're going to ask me about the first guitar I bought, it was to replace a Gibson that Pete Townsend hit the monitor man over the head with, <laughs> and then smashed. And I had to replace that for the next show. <laughs> so you, you are dealing with, okay, first of all, you're dealing with the most famous guitar smasher in history, I for a start. So, yeah, yeah. so I want to ask you, I'm then going to ask everyone else, but I've often wondered with people who are very dedicated to the guitar, whether, and you know, as, as manager of you know, Jimmy Page and, and Pete Townsend, you probably would have seen this, whether the playing style and the kind of relationship with the guitar reflects the character of the person. Well, it does to a degree, and it's very interesting, really, because some of the other people <coughs> that I've been involved with, other bands over the years, I mean, I toured with the Rolling Stones, 72. I was co-manager with Leonard Skinner, who had two lead guitarists. And um, I've always felt that when you look to certain guitar players, for example, Eric Clapton, uh, Jeff Beck, David Gilmour, they weren't that physically animate on stage, but what they did was they saw they were technically fantastic and they morphed into their instruments, so they became sort of part of the instrument. And then, converse, uh, in contrast to that, to cite two really well-known musicians, Pete Townsend, Jimi Hendrix, they were totally different. What they did was they dominated the instrument. They didn't morph into it. They took that instrument, and much like a weapon, they used it, and they did things that you're never supposed to do with the guitar. And it ended up with Hendrix trying to sort of supersede Townsend by burning his guitar and Townsend smashing them. So, um, they again are different personalities entirely and we got a different type of music, you know. It was almost like, I don't know, it was a bit like Rek Maninoff versus Stockhausen, I don't know, you know, but it was such a revelation to watch Hendrix and the young Townsend in the way they played guitar. So on that note, and this is a question to Johnny and Briggs really, um, you know, you've both been in, in very iconic bands, and bands which is not just about, you know, it's not like Julian Bream sitting there and just learning incredibly complex scales. It's more than that, isn't it? It's about, uh, you know, it's about being in a band and everything that goes with it. So what I want to ask you is how central, you know, how good do you need to be? How central is, is the kind of mastery of the instrument? As, you know, is it just an element in the stew, or how does it work? Uh, yeah, but Johnny first. I, I think it's... Um the guitar is it's a conduit for your personality, you know, and I mean, if, if, if you're good at getting your personality across with your guitar, eventually you'll become technically proficient over time because people will want to hear you playing, but you don't have to be technically proficient to start with, you know, and, um, you know, I think, you know, I think that's, that's it, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's lots of people who are technically really good and they tend to work in guitar shops, you know, and they'll play you a really fast riff, you know, <laughs> but that's not really, you know, so, um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting, though, that you said that very, very quickly, it, you, 
you were learning to write a song. You know, it didn't. Yeah. So it wasn't that you had to be fantastic at the guitar before you wanted to find something to say. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a different thing for me because I'm a songwriter. So the guitar is my is is my thing that I can hang my songs on. You know, and I and I'm a rhythm guitarist, right? So for me, the guitar is a drum. Anyway, I don't think of it as as a melodic instrument. You know, I I know that where I sit next with the hi hat is everything, and um, so. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's technical proficiency or not. <laughs> you know, right, but, it's but, but it's time. It's timing, which is important. So, Bricks, the full work, you, you know, you, it was a band which, w again, it was it was about ideas rather than kind of, uh, you know, incredibly fast blues licks. What was the philosophy in that band? And what did you, when you came to that band, when you met Mark and Smith, what did you bring to it? Okay, so technically as a guitarist, I, I wouldn't really rate myself, but I have an amazing like attitude and style. And like Johnny, I'm a songwriter. So the guitar is a way for me to completely express myself and to cement it. Uh, and m my gift is the hook and the riff. It's, it's finding the melodic thread through everything that infects people's minds so that you go away and you wake up with that, those few notes in your head, you know, in the middle of the night. And it, that, that to me is like a winning thing. So when I joined The Fall, the band was already formed. They had made five albums. Uh, they were quite chaotic, ugly. There were moments of beauty. There were soundscapes. There was in two drummers, incredible rhythm, hypnotic. It was kind of all over the place. And, but what I really thought that they needed was this musical thread of melody that wove, like when you have a canvas and you add a light to the shadow. I didn't want to take away from what they were. I loved the band, how they were. I didn't want to push my personality on it, but I wanted to make them ever so slightly more accessible in the most subtle way. So that's what I did. But I'm like a one finger girl, you know. Well, we should yeah, also. More than that, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know what you mean. It's fine. We should also say, though, and this is what I want to know if this annoys you or not. Um, Marky Smith is very famous for fiddling around with the amplifiers. Now, we should also add, if you don't know already, that Marky Briggs was not only playing guitar um, with Marky Smith; she was also married to him, which sort of changes if someone's coming along and you know fiddling around and trying to destroy the settings. How did you cope with that? Well, um, so. I don't know, he, so Mark like thrived on energy and chaos. And so I knew psychologically what he was doing was trying to like throw everything out of whack to make us even play better and gel better and create this kind of chaos by fiddling with our amps. But we were really smart. It started with the bass drum amp, which is like the heart of the band. And you pull the, you pull the microphone out of the bass drum I mean, the microphone was in the bass drum. You pull it out and you take out the heartbeat. So we started to like tape the mic underneath the bass drum where you couldn't see it and put a dummy mic inside. And so every night he'd reach out and he'd pull the mic and throw it and we'd be like, yeah, so pretty much. So we just outsmarted him. Yeah, you just have to deal with the chaos. Yeah. There is, we're surrounded by very, very beautiful guitars and something that Kevin and I were talking about earlier on is, isn't it strange that the older the guitar, the better not the new of the guitar, you know, this is, this is generally the culture. Kevin, I think you said that you've, you've got guitars in the double figures. I so do, So yeah. my question is, starting off, starting off with you, Kevin, if you get a beautiful, you know, I don't know, 1962 Les Paul, fan, you know, beautiful sunburst and everything's fantastic, do you suddenly become an amazing guitar player? <laughs> no, you don't, um, but um, there is something about different instruments that have different things in them, I think there's something in that. And uh, certainly in terms of songwriting, I think you pick up a guitar and sometimes a song comes out of one particular instrument that you wouldn't have written if you picked up a different instrument. But it, what struck me about um, looking around at the guitars around us on the walls and the three guitars that this event is about is that you know, these were built or designed and originally manufactured in the 1950s, and yet they are still the most popular guitars that are bought now in 
20, what year are we in? 2019, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, like, it's rather like if you, you know, the Model T Ford was still being driven 50 years after it had originally designed. So either guitar players are incredibly conservative, uh, which is ironic in rock and roll, or they just got it right first time. You know, Gibson and Fender got it right first time in terms of a design classic. But it is an extraordinary fact, you know, that the same essential design with a few tweaks is still the most popular guitar being sold, you know, 60 odd years later. So when you're going out on stage, Greg, or Johnny, uh, how much are you thinking about the type of guitar and what, you know, what does it have to do? What does it have to do for you? So for years, I played Rickenbackers because they were light and sexy, and I love the way they I love the way they sound for a really heavy amp. <clears throat> but then I also played Fender Telecasters, so I have a really famous pink Paisley one that from the Adult Net days. And then I, my the, the latest guitar I just bought was a Fender Finline Tele, which is black and white, and I call that my workhorse. And that is pretty much the only guitar I play on stage now because it never lets me down, and it's light, and it sounds amazing. Johnny. Uh, um, I also in, I sort of came into an electric guitar, the first electric guitar somebody gave to me just before I started Razorlight, and I still play it. And I just, I have got, I got four spares, which is the same model. It's a, it's a budget Gibson from the 70s, and I still play it. So I, I've just taken that whole uh, variable out of my equation. So I never have to think about it. When I'm in the studio, I use, any, you know, I use anything and everything. But on stage, I, that guitar, it's just, I know where it is, and I know what it does, and in theory, it should get better and better. You know? Bill, have you noticed with, uh, with Pete that he's got certain rituals with his guitars? Are there certain ones that he, he's superstitious about, or that, you know, got to happen from, from way back? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, he plays Strat and he plays Gibson. I've got a Gibson with another case. Um, and Alan Rogan, his technician, I guess if he was sitting here now, he could give us a, a, a lecture for about an hour on Pete's superstitions. But he obviously does have it, and he's got um, a lot of them have got connotations to some of the great shows he's played over the years. You know, he didn't smash all of them. He, he smashed those that were dispensable. Um, or he didn't really like the sound of, I guess, you know. But he's got a really great collection of guitars, and some of them are quite valuable. And um, I suppose he could, he's probably got a story that relates to every one of them, really. You know. So this is a question to everyone, really. Guitars, you know, we're now, here we are in the 21st century, if you listen to so much uh, definitely with pop music, it's made, there is, an instrument has to come in often, you know, it's just been made entirely in a computerized fashion. Where do you think guitar, what, what role do they play now? You know, I mean, do we need them? And why, why are there still so many bands? Why do people still like them? So this is really to, whoever wants to answer that question. Well, really, without the electric guitar, we wouldn't have what we know as rock and roll, or even country music, you know. Um, I just feel that I can't imagine music without the guitar, to be honest. And uh, I don't suppose any of the musicians here could either. It's just a fantastic instrument. And imagine it never having been invented. And I think I'm right in saying it was the first electrical instrument, 31, 32, 1931, 32, incredible. Yeah, I think it's the music of, the, it's, it's the instrument of those genres of music that you mentioned, and originally was there, obviously invented in order to be able to sound louder than the other instruments. As soon as you start playing live drums in a band, you've got to have an electric, you know, guitar, because you can't hear yourself unless you have something you can play louder. And the versatility of it is that, although it's a very simple machine, basically, um, if you look down on the floor here, and, you know, some people in the audience, I'm sure, will be guitar experts, others won't be. There'll be a variety of different pedals and things that the guitarists who play later on will use, which give an incredible versatility of sound that you can get out of that one uh, instrument. So uh, you know, I think originally the Beatles were told guitar bands were going out of style, weren't they, when they uh, originally were turned down to be signed. So I don't think that, that, that it, as an instrument will ever go away. And the fact that we've got this, these design classics still being used so widely all these years later indi indicates that, I think. It feels there must be quite a lot of, you know, there is a lot of romance attached to the guitar, which you sort of don't get the same from like a 24-bit, you know, download. Yeah, I mean, it's a cool thing, right? 
to, to see someone playing a, a guitar or any instrument. But I mean, I, I, I think you touched on why does it still work? I don't know. You know, probably out of the last 10 shows I've been to, eight or nine of them, people, you know, there's always a laptop on stage, you know, and you know that you're listening to their recording of their music and somebody may be playing along to it. I think it's, personally, I think it's a completely different thing. If I go and see live music, I want to see somebody doing their unique interpretation that they're only doing in that moment of their own music that night. For me, that's what musical performance is, you know? So, I liked your question. I thought your question was optimistic. Like, you know, why does it still work? Because I think, to a, to a great extent, a lot of bands aren't approaching it like that. A lot of you know, young people making music certainly aren't approaching it in that way. That's right, but I think there's a physicality to it. That's, that's part that's of it. And I think if you go and see a band, and you know, I mean, if you, you know, when you hear a band and, the, and it's in the pocket and the, the drummer and the bassist and the guitarist are locking in, it's the best thing in the world. Agreed. Yeah, I just, I just think there's an authenticity to the sound that you cannot get digitally. It's just authentic. And also the, the magic when the musicians are playing live and are all connected telepathically in that way. And when sometimes I'm sure you all have been to shows that have been so mind-blowingly fabulous that you actually feel like you've transcended and you've just flown away. And I think that can only happen when you're playing live and you're doing it. And for me, standing up there and holding a guitar is like holding a lightning bolt throwing machine. Boom! <laughs> on that note, how much time do you think you have to put in? You know, you kind of touched on it earlier on, but how much is it about getting up and doing something like you're saying, you know, having that, that bravery to get up and do it, and how much is it about sitting at home for hours and end, you know, in your teenage years and just learning all the chords and scales well, and everything you else? You have to practice and so that you feel completely confident and you've got a wonderful foundation. And from that foundation, when you have your confidence about you, then you're free to, you know, completely create, you know, off the cuff and improvise and you're, you're confident to play with anybody because you know what, you know, you, you, it doesn't matter. And then, you're, and then you have complete freedom. I'd say though, playing a band, because I think Johnny referred to this earlier on, there are, you know, great people who are great guitar players who do shredding and can do this and all that kind of stuff that many of us find baffling. Uh, um, but they're kind of bedroom guitarists, you know, they end up playing with themselves, you know, sort of uh, literally. <laughs> uh, um, whereas if you're in a band, it's a different dynamic. Suddenly, you know, the bass and drums are the foundation of a band. You've got to all work from there up, really, and you've got to start being less, a bit more selfless as a guitar player, although ultimately, when it's time to take your solo, obviously, you know, that's your moment, but it's a different thing, I, and so I'd say, learn the guitar, practice, but join a band. Well, it's a little bit like most sports, isn't it? You can practice and practice, but you have to get out and get in the boxing ring, or get on the tennis court, or go on the golf course. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. You have to go out. And get into the edge. Uh, my experience was the best place to learn was in front of people, right? So as soon as I, as soon as I learned two chords, I went straight out in the street with the guitar, and I mean, like, you know, I don't, you know, when you're starting to play guitar, you're like, <laughs> blang, blang. No way. And I was stopping people in the road, and I was saying, hey, I've got a song. Do you want to hear it? And they're like, no. Okay, you know, but okay, one in ten, one in ten. Okay, I might get one in ten. And then you're there and you're going, just like, no, no, I've got this. And I'd sing it to them. And then I worked out, I made a very quick, um, uh, you know, uh, economic calculation. Because we worked out that, um, we worked out, this is when we were 13, we worked out that you could try and get to a pub and a pint of beer cost you £2.50. But an intense psychedelic drug about that size also cost £2.50. And that get, kept me going for about, 24 hours, whereas a pint would keep you going for one hour. And coincidentally, it took me one hour of busking on the tube to earn £2.50. So I thought, two and two to go my problem sorted, you know? <laughs> and so I learned, I learned to play in front of people, you know? And that was so important to me. And also, I mean, if I think it's worth talking about, actually, the culture of busking, which was where I learned, was the first thing I ever saw of the adult world. Any, si any system that I had any respect for. 
right? Because you go to school and people, you know, teach you to you know, be better at that, and then you might get a job, and then you might get more money, and then you might be more miserable, or whatever it is, right? But here was a system, and this was used to be on the London Underground, and um, you know, before it was, before it was sponsored, you know, by a, by a drinks company and all that kind of stuff. You just go up to whoever was busking, you'd say, when's the next pitch? And it was a true co cooperative, because they'd tell you, come back at five o'clock. So as a 13-year-old, trying to make drug money, I had, I had a job, you know what I mean? I'd, I'd do five, six hours a day. I'd go from station to station. And that, to me, that was the difference between myself and so many of the, the musicians that I was friends with when I was a kid, because they were playing in their rooms. And everything I learned, I learned in front of people, and then going and playing folk clubs and stuff like that, never, never amped up and learning how to get people's attention. Because really, music's a communication, right? So if you're not communicating with other people, then you're not. what are you doing? Something I learned, actually, is, uh, you know, I'd go and see a band, and I thought, oh, that's fantastic. And then they come off stage, and go, oh my god, I made so many mistakes. And I realized, yeah. if you start and end, it doesn't kind of, sort of doesn't matter what goes on in the middle. <laughs> you can get away with a lot, you know? It kind of makes it better. I always think if, if you can go a bit woo halfway through and then pull it back, a bit of chaos, like you say, Marky Smith, right? You know, a bit of chaos, but as long as you come back from the chaos, bang on. That, to me, that's a perfect gig. And that's why I don't like watching bands that use drum machines or backing tracks, which is most of them, actually. So. We haven't got that much time. I'm going to ask Kevin a very quick question, which is, in your experience in, in, uh, you know, in, in politics, have you found a uh, political divide in terms of the kind of music that people like? <laughs> well, I, I play in a cross-party band with a Tory drummer, a SMP keyboard player who was in a band called Runrig in his other life, and, uh, and a, a Labour bass player and a Labour guitar and singer. But actually, funnily enough, quite a lot of Tories seem to be into heavy metal. Uh, <laughs> the, former, the former culture secretary, John Whittingdale, I once found myself on an occasion in a karaoke booth, don't ask me how, with John Wettingdale, and, and, and he was singing Smoke on the Water with an in an incredibly posh accent. And I, I've noticed there's a few, few Tories who are into heavy metal. I don't know why that should be, but that seems to be an association anyway. Okay, and so now this is a question to everyone, and that is a very simple one. Who is your favorite guitarist? I think, Bill, I don't know if you could answer this. Well, you might be slightly compromised, but uh, who would you say is your favorite guitarist? Honestly, I would say Jimmy Page. Briggs? Jimmy and Jimmy. I, I have to pick both. The twins. <laughs> well, James Dean Bradfield is my constituent, so I have to uh, give him a big up. And he is a great guitar player, by the way. He plays Les Paul. Uh, Mick Ronson, I think, was who, as a kid, you know, growing up, is what, you know, who I idolize on guitar. Uh, I'd probably go all the way back to the beginnings of guitar music, and um, uh, that I'd have either Blind Blake or Reverend Barry Davis. And if you don't know him, check it out, and you'll see why. So yeah, I mean, I, I, and this is, I'm just gonna finish on this one. So, so why those guys? What, what, what is it in their sound that, that, uh, that does it for you? Um, timing, expression truth and beauty. Um, Mick Ronson, I think the end of Moon Age Daydream, you know, which is sort of this incredible, my favorite outro of any record and just this incredible progression of a guitar solo that leads you into a kind of ecstatic moment. That's that, certainly when I was a teenager, that just blew me away. Do you mean, do you mean? Yeah, but now I'm thinking Prince. Great. It's like really Great hard. But then we're on a very, very long tangent on yeah, uh, incredible sorry. musicians. No, it's fine. Um, I think I think I I think I think I'll go with Hendrix because uh, as a teenager, when I was about thirteen, I used to come home from school, uh, hang out with the boys in my class, smoke a spliff, put on headphones, and listen to Jimi Hendrix play guitar. And it, I was I couldn't believe those sounds were coming out of a guitar. It was alchemy. It was magical, and it stands up today like as good as anything ever was. And Jimmy Page for you, what, what's he do that's, that you find so? Well, I think Jimmy Page has got <coughs> all of the technical ability that you see in Clapton and Beck and a lot of other players, but he's also got drama, which 
you can sing in Kashmir, uh, Stairway to Heaven, and a lot of the other songs, you know. And that drama, plus his technical ability, just puts him a smidgen in front of a lot of other guitarists for me. So this leads me to say, Johnny Burrell, Kevin Brennan, Peter Smith-Tart, and Bill Kirbishley, thank you so much. <laughs>